لل فلا هادي له ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وصفوته من خلقه وحبيبه قد بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الغمة وجاهد في سبيل دينه حتى أتاه اليقين فاللهم اجزه عنا وعن الإسلام والمسلمين خير ما جزيت به نبيا عن قومه ورسولا عن أمته اللهم أحينا على سنته وأمتنا على ملته واحشرنا تحت لوائه وأوردنا حوضه واسقنا من يده الشريفة شربة هنيئة لا نظمأ بعدها أبدا اللهم آمين I'm going to continue to address our youth with the second part of my message because we need to focus on their understanding of the mission and I know that most of you do not belong to the 15-25 age bracket but it doesn't hurt to know what your children's mission is. It used to be that at the time of the Prophet وسلم, the companions would attend a prayer with the Prophet وسلم. They will hear him talk, whether it is Friday or was he just giving a remark. And they used to go back either to their shops or homes and communicate that message to their co-workers, their employees, their partners, their families, their children. The reason the women and children sections of our societies and communities are as uneducated as they are is the fact that we do not do that. We attend the Friday prayer, we listen to the khutbah, and we go about our life as if they are not our responsibility. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had not charged women with children care, he would have required them to be here on Friday. So he invited you and made it mandatory for us men so that we go back home and make sure they get the message. And let me tell you the extension of that. There is a huge punishment from Allah on those who conceal the knowledge, the guidance of Allah. Those who conceal the knowledge and the guidance of Allah, after we have made it clear unto them, those are cursed by Allah and by those who curse. So what is the curse? The curse is our families become lost. When our children reach teenage, we cannot control them. We cannot even talk to them. So if we spend the first 10 years of our life communicating one hadith each Friday, our children would have learned something. Whatever is gone is gone. But at least from now on, let us use the Friday khutbah for what it is meant. This is the only mandatory educational forum that Allah has made mandatory. And to let us understand how important it is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِذَا نُودِيَ لِلصَّلَاةِ مِنْ يَوْمِ الْجُمُعَةِ فَاسْعَوْا إِلَى ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ we know that money is very important for life. We all know that. But Allah is telling us, attending the Friday prayer and educational forum is more important than your business. So you make sure every week to bring some money home, some food, some clothing, whatever the family needs, we make sure that we get it. But don't they need knowledge also? And where do we get it? The vast majority of the Muslim communities do not attend special classes. No matter what the class is. Quran, Hadith, whatever. And at Dar al-Hijra, we do have classes. 
we are actually over full. The premises is not able anymore to take so many classes at the same time between men, women, children, youth. So the programs are there, but we don't have time. So Friday, Friday is a mandatory attendance for men. Why? As it is mandatory for them to pick food and grocery before they go home, it is also equally mandatory to pick some knowledge and take it home. Why is this forum mandatory? It is mandatory because of its cumulative effect. The more you hear the same thing, the more it sinks and it settles, the more you absorb it. The Quran uses the repetition style even though there is no actual repetition in the Quran, but there are some places where important issues are hammered more frequently than others. So you find, for example, Aqimu Salah 173 times. 10 times would have been enough. 20 times would have been enough. But Allah wants us to frequently see what matters. So if every week you just pick one hadith or one ayah and make it the week's central issue for your family, your family will grow with you. But unfortunately, after the khutbah, 10 minutes are gone, and most of us would have forgotten what the topic even was about. Not a hadith, not an ayah. And I'm not being facetious here. I'm trying to illustrate for you if you feel you're not getting enough or you're not getting much while you have attended, imagine what your child is deprived of. It's a lot. And week after week after week, 52 weeks every year would have been a good cumulative amount of knowledge. So I hope that by hammering some issues from different angles, from different perspectives, that we pick the materials, go home. And the material is currently available on YouTube. So that also removes the other excuse. We used to do it live. At least now it is recorded and available on the internet. The you know, fa past few weeks, we have been putting them on the internet. So that point is on the side, and I hope that it is clear enough. Last week, we spoke to our children about the importance of focusing on their mission, not as children, but their mission as future men and women who are members of our community, members of our society, citizens of this nation, and citizens of the world. And we said that the world is full of corruption, political corruption, financial corruption, moral corruption, ethical corruption, all types of corruptions are there. It takes more than one generation to do it, but somebody has to start. So we mentioned for our youth last time that we want to target their generation to take up this task, to resolve, to be part of the solution. It is not enough to keep complaining. We have to figure solutions. And Islam is the solution. Islam is the answer. Islam is the cure. Islam is the treatment for all the ills of individuals, families, societies, and nations. Islam guides us and tells us what is our role in society. No society will advance if the individuals do not care to learn and determine what their mission is in this life. So we want our youth to understand that they are the future. One day, some of them will be sitting here and one of them will be standing here, and they will be leading the charge on behalf of this community. So they should not be treated to shrink or to fear. 
We want our children to be able to say no when no is due and to jump on a task when jumping on the task is due. They should not retreat. And the only way to do it is for our generation to divorce fear completely. Since 9-11, our community has not crossed over the fear of either Islamophobia or illegitimate undue process of legal biases against one or 10 or 20 of their members. And we have seen cases that this is true. But the only way out of this dungeon is for us to start going back, all of us, men, women, children, youth, go back to the Qur'an. Go back to the original message of the Qur'an. And alhamdulillah, we have no excuse to say we don't understand the Qur'an. Today, knowledge is running after every one of us. I cannot overemphasize this. Knowledge is coming to your inbox while you're sitting at home. All what you need to do is just to open it and read it. Many of us are getting messages either as text or email or chats or Twitter or anything. We are getting good messages and we're getting other messages. If we just pick the good messages, they form a good source of information as well. Alhamdulillah, Muslims were not late jumping on the good side of the internet. But is this the case for our youth? Do they pick the right websites? Do they look for the right topics? Do they learn from the right sources? This is something we need to help them with. We need to help them when, with choosing what good websites offer the right information. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us in the Quran, قُلْ هَذِهِ سَبِيلِي أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ This is my path. Say, O Muhammad, this is my path. I call unto Allah. أَنَا وَمَنِ اتَّبَعَنِي Me and all those who follow me عَلَى بَصِيرَةٍ All of us on one clear vision. As a, as a family, as a community, we have one vision. What is the vision? The vision is قُلْ إِنَّ صَلَاتِي وَنُسُكِي وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِي لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ So what I want to address the youth with today is a very simple message. To have power, you have to know the sources of power in this life. And there are so many sources of power. And without power, we cannot pull that heavy train we call the community, we cannot pull it forward. We need a strong engine. Last time we mentioned the statement of the Prophet وسلم, when he says, Nasarani shabab wa khadalani shiyukh. The youth supported me and the elders let me down. We want you, the youth, to pick up from where everybody has finished. Wherever and whatever the elders have done of good, pick it up and move forward with it. Whatever we have done wrong or failed to do, you pick it up because it's your future. And it is your following generation, your own children, our own grandchildren will be entrusted in your hand by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have to be ala basiratin ana wa mani tabaani. I have to have this vision, this clear view. One of the things that you find in real life is the fact that if you are driving a train or if you are driving a big truck, a teen wheeler truck, how often do you look to the rear mirror? just parsley to catch a glimpse as to what's going on around you. But all of your focus and attention is on what is ahead of you, what is your future. And if any driver focuses on the rear mirror, they will run into many accidents in few minutes. They cannot take two blocks. Our ummah 
has been looking to the back rear mirror for centuries, either to brag and boast about our forefathers' achievements, or to lament and blame them for their failures. We've done enough of that. Let us move the truck forward. Let us look ahead of us. What do we need to do? Our youth, I tell you, you need to learn and know what are the sources of power that will help you pull forward that heavy truck or that train, the train of your ummah. Number one, the power of your faith and the power of your devotion and the power of your discipline. As far as the power of your faith, the Prophet ﷺ says, المؤمن القوي خير وأحب إلى الله من المؤمن الضعيف. A strong believer is better and more beloved to Allah than a weak believer. If you want to play a رهبانية صوفية type of Islam to sit, hold on to your beads and keep making dhikr and make your jilbab that short and that long and that's your focus, may Allah help us. May Allah help our ummah. But if your focus is to fill in the gap and to pick up from where others have stopped or failed, then you become a strong believer. You become more beloved and more liked by Allah than a weak believer. So what is the strength that the hadith is talking about? It is the strength of our faith. If your faith is strong, you can face trouble without bending. You can face challenges without breaking down. You can face even enemies and stand tall. Why? Because your heart is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your life is dedicated to Allah. قُلْ إِنَّ صَلَاتِي وَنُسُكِي وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِي If that becomes your motto in life, then you know where the sources of power are. First is your faith. And your faith is not strong unless you devote for your faith time and resources. So how good is my faith if I don't give it the time it takes to grow it? If I don't grow it, faith and language are like any muscle in the body. If you don't use it, you lose it. If you don't grow it stronger, it grows weaker. So faith without devotion is going to get weaker. Devotion without discipline, which means to systematically apply yourself to the task required of you. That's discipline. To give the task required of you what it takes of energy and time at the time you are required to do it. So if zakah is due and you plan to do it in Ramadan, then before Ramadan, you would have done your calculations and you would have known who are the people that you're going to reach out with your zakah with. So we have to get to define those sources, those basic sources, faith, devotion, and discipline. But those are not the only sources of power. Those are sources of you being a human, you being a believer, and you being actively engaged in your society. But there are other sources of power. Knowledge is power. Because without knowledge, how do you plan? How do you know where your interest is? And knowledge is not just, it is not limited to your religious text. Knowledge of everything. Dawood, Allah gave us his example. Allah taught him how to make armories to teach us that even though he was a prophet, but Allah wanted him to be physically ready to push back against those 
who want to decimate his community. So physical power is one other source. Material power is another source. But let us focus on knowledge. Knowledge also is to know your faith as much as you know your resources. You know your power limitations. Very important. You know what you know and you're aware of what you don't know. So our community worldwide, unfortunately, is now currently at the tail of all nations, trailing behind everybody. Educationally, health system crumbled. Uh, whatever a human being needs, we don't have it. I got in uh, my WhatsApp program, somebody sent me a message saying one of the presidents or emirs or kings or leaders in the Middle East went to some hospital in Germany to undergo a surgery. So the surgeon asked, who is this? He doesn't look German. Who is this? And he has guards and stuff outside. And she told him he is the king or the president of this country. He says, poor him. How long has he been president? She said, about 30 years. He said he failed to build a hospital in his country to even treat himself or even his family. Why should I care for him? You see the point? When we are, as an ummah, importing food, we are about to import water soon, importing medicine, let alone other technological stuff that is needed. Why? Because we have never worked for Allah. We've always worked for someone else to protect our thrones. And we, the people, supported those thrones on our own shoulders for centuries. How many presidents or emirs given up their uh, authority, sultan, power, position, alive? I'm sure we can only count one. Do you know anyone else? Do we know anyone else? Why? Because they take us for granted. <laughs> they get to the throne and we are taken for granted. They have a nice ride for 30, 40, 50 years. They never get out of their position alive. Except for Suwar al Dhab of Sudan, the president who used to be an army general, I met him personally. And I told him, why don't you, General Swar, why didn't you stay in power? I met him after uh, he stepped down. Why didn't you continue until the nation is stable? And his answer really shocked me. He said, this position is not cut for me, and I'm not cut for this position. I'm an army general. I can go back and serve as a soldier. That's why he was able to resign. And he's happy with it. Other people, not in our nations, not in the Muslim nations, other people leave by the virtue of election. Their time is up. And every time someone's time is up, he looks back and says, I wish they could give me one more term, just one more term. But the point here is, why is it that they take us for granted? It is because when you lower your back, somebody is going to want to ride it. So a nation that raises children and youth, young men and women, with dignity and power can never be manipulated. This is one of the failures of our forefathers. They did not raise a generation that stands tall and powerful no matter what. They raised us saying, be careful. Don't speak politics. Don't stand out. Be careful. 
walk around and next or inside the wall. You know the wall. We need to challenge our children to be men at young age. As we mentioned last time, Usama ibn Zayd, who led the army in which there was Abu Bakr and Umar, right? And he was how old? 16, 17 years old. That's, that's amazing. Prophet Dawood السلام, was not very old when he led the army against Goliath. He was not. He was a young man. But Allah gave him the power of faith and the power of the body and the power of preparedness. He was ready to stand up. And when he faces Goliath, he's not shaken, he's not trembling, he's not weakened, his knees are not shaken. No. A man is a man. So we need this generation of ours to look for these sources of power, the power of faith, the power of commitment and devotion, the power of discipline and the power of knowledge. Part of the knowledge that our generation lacks, but this great generation we're trying to talk to and raise and push forward, they need to learn our history. Since the time Muslims started to decline from before Andalusia, by the way, forward, when we started to become despotic regimes instead of Islamic regimes, even though the name Khilafa continued to be a title, but they started to act as despotic as our regimes, killing their opposition, decimating rights, uh, judging by their own whims and desires, that's not something I'm interested in going back to. What I'm interested in is that our children, they need to know not only points in history when Muslims achieved their best, but also when they lost and they were at their worst, so that they do not repeat those mistakes and they focus with their own children on what matters, what builds. So the power of knowledge is very important. And knowledge, as I mentioned, is not limited to Islamic knowledge, but all sorts of knowledge. So I want to ask our youth, if up to high school and down into your college, most of you do not know what major they want to pick, when do you start accumulating knowledge? When do you start accumulating knowledge? Have you seen a mechanic who is successful in his profession, who was doing 10 other professions before? You really could find anyone like this. Knowledge is a cumulative activity. So if you focus early on, where are your strengths? Where are your weaknesses? What are the subjects you do well at with little or moderate effort? This is your strength. That becomes your strength. So if your strength is in math, don't tell me I'm specializing in English. You're wasting your life. You will just try it sometime and go back. And if your strength is in languages, don't try to get into engineering. And we parents need to be careful how to advise our children to identify their points of strength so that they can do early choices of their major. I know a lot of children and youth who are two years into college and they don't know what they want to do. When do they become specialized? So that's another issue in the area of knowledge Hesitation, reluctance, indecisiveness can waste a lot of precious time in their most productive life period in their life, which is the youth. We know the hadith of the Prophet 
لا تزول قدم عبد يوم القيامة حتى يسأل عن أربع Nobody's foot will move a step forward on the straight path towards Allah until he answers four questions. The first is عن عمره فيما أفناه What did you use your life for? What was your life mission? What did you achieve? Did you live with a mission? Or did you live a random haphazard life? Did you just live day by day, waiting for the night to come, waiting for the day to come, and the next week, and the next month, and the next year? عن عمره فيما أفناه وشبابه فيما أبلاه and his youth with all the energy that comes with the youth period, what did you invest? What did you consume your energy to achieve? وَشَبَابِهِ فِيمَا أَبْلَهِ What was your struggle? To show one girl that you love her, or one boy that you love him? To get a degree that's meaningless? Or to join a team of players? Or to follow a team of artists or players or you know, uh, those actors and actresses. Is this what life was for you as a youth with all of this energy? What did you do with it? Then, وَعَنْ عِلْمِهِ مَاذَا عَمِلَ فِيهِ His knowledge, how did he use it? Unfortunately, when our children come to ask a question, we just give them the answer, which is nice if they can find us. This is the nice stuff. But most of the time, with that nice stuff, we forget to remind them of what they know to dig out the answer from their own knowledge pack. They have a set of knowledge, so it's easier for us to say the answer is this, instead of saying, could you go and research? Have you, have you come across this issue before? So we need to be a little bit more sophisticated in dealing with our children. Could you search every child of ours today? They could deal with Google better than we can. They could get the knowledge for themselves. So what we do is we teach them to be lazy. As the American cliche goes, if you want to raise a handicapped child, do for them things they could do for themselves. So they eat, you take the plates from the table to the kitchen, you wash it, you tell them when the next meal is going to be, but they don't help in any way. We raise a handicapped generation. And instead of actively engaged individuals. So when it comes to knowledge, they need to know where are the sources of knowledge they should pick. Whether it is in the area of history, in the area of journalism, in the area of religion. And when I say religion, I'm not saying they should only learn Islam. But at least Islam. <laughs> Because they cannot learn other faith traditions if they are poor and weak in their own. So we have to lay the foundation early on so that when they get to high school, they are able to engage in the study of world religions, not to be limited. So when we talk about knowledge as a source of power, it is so engaging, as you could see. The other source of power is Money. If you could make money and save money and invest money and learn about money, you will be better than your parents. Your parents use the money they could get and they consume it, all of it. So they don't have saving, they don't have investment, except for very few. If your generation becomes as poor with money as our generation, your generation will not have the power to develop itself, let alone to help the society around us. So I will stop with those 
few issues and I hope that our children are listening or at least you will tell them there is something for them to listen. Thank you. الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وبعد اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على محمد وعلى أهله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا The next point of power is the power of collective will and collective wisdom Unlike your parents you should not grow up in divisive atmosphere. You should grow up as Muslims as Allah has told all of us to be. The power of collective will and collective cooperation is very unique and we know that Europe is united now because they see the power of collective cooperation. They see the power of togetherness. Our generation, the older generation, unfortunately, has not seen the light of this yet. We grew up divided by national borders, by colors, by ethnicities, by language, by customs, traditions, habits, desires. The only antidote to all of those divisive issues is to collectively try to become Muslims. So this new generation needs to learn how to put Islam first. Before what I want, before what you want, before we engage in a discussion, we should always focus on what does Islam say about this issue. So when Allah becomes our reference and the Prophet ﷺ becomes our unifying example. So even if we differ a bit, it is within the house. It's not out of line. So it's okay to have different understanding of different ayah, different hadith. But when it comes to action, listen to the people that you choose as leaders. And let those leaders live by your expectations, not the other way around. Leaders are not mom and dad in a community. A leader is not your father. A leader is someone that you want to follow voluntarily because they lead you where you want to go. They want to take you to paradise by their plan, their action, their leadership style, their model. This is what we need. Leaders that come by imposition are Islamically illegitimate, civilly illegitimate, and humanely illegitimate. They have no legitimacy whatsoever. So we need to learn to choose our leaders and to support them and to obey their commands and to follow their footsteps so long as they are following the footsteps of the Prophet this also is a change we need in the new generation. This is what will make our new generation a real greater generation than their fathers and grandfathers and mothers. So my dear young daughters and sons, look at the Quran and see if you could take one page a day and how much knowledge it will give you just a simple task and go for one month every day one single page in the language of your comfort and if you have questions ask people of knowledge around you and if you don't ask an imam that you choose but keep doing this for one month and see the blessings and the power of knowledge coming to you to your heart, to your head, and to your saluk, your behavior, your choices. You will see the blessings of Allah in your life. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of us with power of faith and the power 
of commitment and the power of discipline and the power of knowledge and the power of money and the power of unity. اللهم هدنا في من هديت وعافنا في من عافيت وتولنا في من توليت وقنا واصرف عنا شر ما قضيت اللهم اقسم لنا من خشيتك ما تحول به بيننا وبين معصيتك ومن طاعتك ما تبلغنا به جنتك ومن اليقين ما تهون به علينا مصائب الدنيا ومتعنا اللهم بأسماعنا وأبصارنا وقوتنا ما أحييتنا واجعله الوارث منا واجعل ثأرنا على من ظلمنا ولا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا اللهم لا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا مبلغ علمنا ولا إلى النار مصيرنا وإذا أردت بقومنا فتنة فنجنا منها يا مولانا غير خزايا ولا مفتونين ولا مبدلين ولا مغيرين أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فستذكرون ما أقول لكم وأفوض أمري إلى الله إن الله بصير بالعباد